I'll start with Justin, um, a quick inter a quick introduction, well, update on some of the things that have been going on in Springfield um, since the since the governor's bu budget address on February 18th. As some of you may be aware, um, we're still dealing with issues from the proposed F, well, the past at this point, FY15 budget, where we have about a $1.6 billion deficit that we're trying to fill. So we've been working with the governor's office to come up with a solution to deal with the $1.6 billion budget deficit from the FY15 um, budget year. Uh, these are some of the cuts, that, well, the underfunding to child care, um, DOC, many other, hello, child care, DOC, um, many other programs. And the, the proposed solution at this point is to, been doing, to, to do fund sweeps throughout, um, throughout different, I think we're getting in and out on this, but uh, fund sweeps from different funds. Um, throughout the state that we have to come up with the money as well as some proposed cuts. At this point, there is nothing in writing. Okay, so, so we're still working through that right now. It's, it's just, it's, it's a tough issue. We have a new governor on the second floor with a very different approach to dealing with the state's budget. And um, uh, it's, it's, been, it's even difficult to call the it's conversations that we've had, no, negotiations, it's been more discussions and back and forth on how we can deal with this issue. So um, we're hoping to deal with it this week. We'll see. Um, FY16 budget planning, the appropriate appropriation committees have begun to meet, but there has been no real movement on FY15 budget discussions um, because we haven't shored up, shored up everything as it relates to FY15. So that's the big, big concern um, right now. And again, I'm hoping that we will have this addressed in the next week or so. Um, some of the proposed cuts that were mentioned in the governor's FY16 budget on February 18th um, were that he would eliminate funding for arts and foreign language, the Children's Mental Health Partnership Program, advanced placement courses, after school matters, the Parent Mentorship Program, and regional safe schools and state board of education budget. The proposed budget will reduce funding to special education, it reduces the share of income tax given to local governments from 8% to 5%, reducing the total local governments, reducing the total amount that local governments receive by 600 million. It reduces Medicaid reimbursement rates to hospitals and nursing homes, reduces funding to the Department of Health and Family Services by 1.5 billion, including funding for the specialized mental health rehabilitation facilities. In the Department of Human Services, funding for the Division of Alcohol and Substance Abuse is reduced by 27.5 million. The Division of Mental Health is reduced by 82 million. And the Early Intervention Program is reduced by 23 million. Additionally, there will be reduced funding for the state's Infant Mortality Program and Early Intervention Program. It eliminates funding for the Sunnet Infant Death Syndrome Program. Some DHS programs are completely eliminated, including Best Buddies, Project Autism, Arc of Illinois, Homeless Youth Services, Immigration Interrogation Services, oh, excuse me, Immigration Integration Services, and Illinois Welcoming Centers. It cuts funding for higher education by 400 million, including a 30% cut to public universities and el elimination of the Illinois Board of Higher Education grants. It increases funding for the Adult Redeploy Program by $3.5 million, but it reduces funding for ceasefire by nearly $3 million and eliminates funding for bullying prevention and the meth pilot program. It cuts funding by, for RTA by one, $127 million, which includes cuts to CTA, Metra, PACE, and reducing the RTA's reduced fare program, cutting all state funding for LAHEAP and numerous other cuts. Now, the only, the only silver lining in this is that it's just a proposed budget at this point. The governor still has to work with the House of Representatives as well as the Senate, and we have to craft a budget, send it to his desk for approval, and be signed into law. And so the proposed cuts um, that, that I just mentioned, some are, are completely off the table and things that we would never consider doing. And I think it's evidence of um, the sort of group that the, the second floor, I say the second floor, the governor's office has brought in to um, do the budget analysis and do cleanup. I mean, they're truly approaching um, this as a business. And this is government with um, real, real um, impacts on real people 
that affect real families every single day. And so we're trying to help him understand that as we work through and prepare to start working on the FY16 budget. But again, the FY15 concerns are huge right now. And um, I believe as of April 1st, there will be no funding for, for child care anymore. They will stop funding for prison guards at the Department of Correction. I mean, it's a doomsday situation. So this next week will be very important just in terms of getting something done. And even that won't be pretty. The proposed cuts are, from what I'm hearing and what, may, what we may have to vote on, would be almost $1.3 million, no, $1 billion in fund sweeps. Um, some of the biggest coming from the road fund, um, local government, um, distributive fund, and others, and a 2.25 cut across the board to everything. The tricky part about that piece is the 2.25 cut across the board is based on the number that we started with at the beginning of the FY15 budget. So at this point, it's not going to be prorated like uh, from now until June, 2.25% of that will be cut. It will be 2.25% of your overall budget cut, which at this point could amount to about 8.5% to 10% cut of the money that you have yet to receive. It's going to be tough. But um, I think in, in that pro proposition as well, there was complete funding for the child care program. So um, there's some, some, some give and take and back and forth throughout the budget, but again, it's not going to be pretty at all. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, it's it's going to be an interesting process. Um, this is a brand new administration, like I mentioned before, on the second floor, and um, we have a, 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 an established way of doing things that they don't really necessarily agree with. The governor would like, from, from what's being suggested now to deal with the FY15 piece, the governor wanted straight Clark Blanche authority to move money and do what he want with it the, with the FY15 budget as well as the budgets going forward and we've talked them back down from that um, but still it's going to be a very difficult process and FY16 will be even harder with deeper cuts being proposed so um, that's the doom and gloom update from Springfield along with the other policy decisions and, and, and concerns that we're trying to address around uh, clean energy, prison reform, sentencing reform, uh, minimum wage. Good news, we just got the minimum wage passed last week through committee in the House of Representatives. This is the first time any action has been taken on minimum wage in the House of Representatives for close to six or seven years, longer than I've even been a state representative. So um, that's a good sign with there just being an appetite for um, increasing the minimum wage across the state. Um, so there are some good things happening, but again, the biggest concern is being the budget. And we're just going to go ahead and get along with the program at this point and address any questions or concerns or anything like that toward the end of our meeting today. And Valerie Leonard, are you ready to go? Why don't you go to the Reverend first? Okay. All right. All right. Well, Reverend, are you ready? We'll start. You want to start with the policy discussion first? That's all right with you? Okay, good. We'll go ahead and do that then. So um, we have Reverend Booker Vance, from policy, policy director from Faith in Place, who's going to talk to us about um, some clean energy legislation that's being proposed in Springfield. You have to work with this mic, Graf. Yeah, I know. Okay. Give him a round of applause. Amen. Good evening. It's just good to see all of you guys out. You know, we've got, through, we've got thrown off this morning when we saw all that snow, and we knew it was March the 23rd. And, but we, you as faithful folk have forged your way out, and we want to make sure we do the correct use of your time. Um, first thing I want to, to say, a couple of things. I'm going to hit a bunch of issues around this issue, but first I just need you to repeat after me. Remember to vote. <laughs> Remember to, vote. remember to vote. Not only do you remember to vote, but take somebody with you. Because you have shown yourself to be faithful, and, and I know some of you even voted today, uh, but you need to make sure that you take somebody with you. Because it's not enough for you to vote if we don't take other folk with us. And I got a preaching voice, but I haven't figured out whether I'm going to use that yet, but this is, this is going in and out, so please be mindful of that. I'm just excited to be here. My name is Reverend Booker Vance. I'm with Faith in Place which is an environmental group that basically uh, advocates for uh, issues surrounding uh, the environment and, and how it affects us. 
And one of the things that when I took this job and when I began to work with Faith in Place, and I want to thank uh, Representative Turner in particular for last spring, he came out and talked on the South Side. And I said earlier that I was from the South Side, but I didn't really mean that. I meant I'm from the South. I'm from Houston, Texas. Uh, but I just happen to be here in Chicago right now. But I didn't want to offend anybody by saying I'm from the South Side, but you know how that is. <laughs> but one of the things, he came down South and South Side and began to talk, and he's a, a very conscious brother and has a lot of uh, uh, concerns. And when I went into his office and talked about this bill, uh, he, we were on the same page. And so the question was now, how do we help African-American communities in particular be, understand the difficulties and the challenges that are going on in the environment? So this particular bill, 2607, which is the House bill, it has three components. The first component is clean air. The second component is clean jobs. And the third component is, hold on, I just lost it. I went out of my head. Is the other point it is, is uh, clean energy. Uh, and what that means is that, and I'm keeping it simple, is because one of the things that you recognize as both seniors and young people that asthma has disproportionately affects uh, communities of color. And if you didn't have an inhaler when you were young, some of you as seniors are getting inhalers now. And it has a lot to do with the carbon emissions that are going on in our communities. And so part of this bill deals with clean air. The second piece talks about clean energy. One of the things that happens because of the use of carbon and other uh, types of energy we find in our communities that, that we have uh, uh, the, the inability that we find ourselves overstressed. And so the issue of clean energy talks about solar and wind and particularly jobs surrounding solar and wind. And one of the things that's very important for us to understand that clean energy means that we, we, we leave this world better and this place better than when we found it. And so it's through the type of energy that we do use in solar and, and particularly solar and wind or new forms of energy. And around these new forms of energy come jobs. Now, one of the things that's important is, is jobs, because if folk can, can't breathe and they can't work, then we got a real problem. And so this, this, this bill talks about clean jobs, and it creates 32,000 jobs over a five-year period. Now, one of the things that came up with this discussion when this bill came forward, and, and that's why I like these brothers that are, and sisters that are downstate, is that I knew when I walked into Representative Turner's office, he's heard promises of jobs a bunch of times. And so I went back to the group that was proposing this bill and said, how do we find this? How does this come out? And how do we make sure that these jobs in our community? And part of the things, there's another handout that you'll find out in the back, which explains in detail about how training job training for solar jobs and how, how training for these energy jobs are, are available to us. And we have to make sure we connect the dots so that our people get the jobs and our, these businesses come into our community but it means that we have to make sure that we put ourselves in a position so that when these companies and the Clean Bill Coalition is a number of companies that from solar companies to other energy companies that have coalitioned together to make sure that this bill is presented, we have to make sure they provide jobs in our community. And that part is still being worked out. But, but, it, but the proposal is that there'll be 32,000 jobs over a five year period, five, year, five years of 32,000 jobs. And, and the other part that we had to work on, and, and you'll see this in this, this document, is to work on the language. One of the things that uh, you know, I was sensitive to, and I don't know if you were sensitive to this, but sometimes when these bills that you have this benevolent paternalism that's in the bill, and so they'll say things like, this is for low-income people. And so when they started talking low-income, I kept said, no, don't use that language. Use moderate to low-income because we have people with a variety of issues that are being challenged economically. Everybody ain't low po, but the reality is we all need in our communities when we're economically disadvantaged that we need jobs and resources that help us in our communities. And so we had to make sure that the language was changed appropriately so that we could understand our see ourselves in the picture because in, in the relationship to this. And so that, that was the second part was the issue of clean jobs and clean energy. And so this bill is before us, and, and it's important for us to understand that we've, we're putting this in a house, we've presented this, and it's, it's in committee right now, but I wanted to make sure that you understood this on the local level about what was going on. Now, one of the ways you can help me, and that's one of the reasons you're going to have a, a discussion by the sister, that's where she's getting the, she's getting the, the overhead together, because one of the things that she's going to talk about is a survey. And the survey is accessible online. I've seen the survey already. And the survey is very important 
because one of the things that helps Representative Turner is data. And, and, and once you put data together, then it helps his argument when he goes to make his argument before uh, downstate. And so one of the things I need your help is data also. And, I, and I'm appreciating in the room here that everybody don't want to sign anything. But one of the things that helps is petitions. And petitions are an indication that when I walk into a representative's office and I say this is an issue, and then I slap down 100 petitions, then that person listens to me. If I walk in and just say, hey, I got a concern, and they say, well, who are you and where you come from? And so I've got petitions that I need you to sign, and basically it calls for this bill and other environmental bills of issues that are impacting our communities uh, that, that is very important for us to understand that we're, we want to see this stuff happen and we want to see it be impactful in our communities. So make sure you sign a petition. The final thing that I want to suggest in this discussion is that Lobby Day, we have an Earth Day, which is April the 22nd. We're taking buses down to Springfield. Now, one of the things, if you've ever seen Representative Turner, he works that hill. And he's, he's talking to folk and, 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 and interacting with folk. But one of the things that you need to see and he needs to see is folks standing behind him. And one of the reasons, ways we do that is on Earth Day, which is April 22nd, or a lobby day down in Springfield. There'll be buses going from the south side and other places, but you have a handout that says, meet me at the state capitol. And if you haven't been down there, you, we want you to come down there, and you need to make your presence known on a regular basis. Because the only reason Ron is going to expect, respect any of us is if we show unified force and we show persistence. And this is one of the ways it'll be a, bo it'll be a bus, both of them are coach buses, so we don't have to ride the yellow hound all the way down there. But it'll be a coach bus, and we want to make sure that you're involved in that and want to be involved. The, the price is $20. But if you have an issue, a uh, challenge financially, we'll make sure you get on the bus, okay? Because it does cost gas and those kind of things. But one of the things is important. So we want to make sure that's happening. So, so though, that's the general kind of overview uh, of, of this bill. Uh, we talked about the survey and the petitions. We talked about environment, literature, sign of position. I'm trying to make sure I cover everything, bro. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, I just want to say this again. Remember to vote and take somebody with you. And if there's any questions, we can uh, entertain those at this particular time. Any questions concerning uh, clean, air, clean energy language? 2607, and that's House bill. And then uh, I'm learning this, there's two types of bills. There's a House bill, 2607, and then there's a Senate bill, which is 1425. And, and uh, the, there's also one of the things that we're going to work on, and we have to continue to work on, and, and Representative, is that you got to use your telephone. One of the things that, that these was good by the cell phone, and one of the things that was magic during the Obama election, but on it, is that when they did phone banking, they used cell phones. And when you have unlimited minutes, that means you can call anywhere, anytime, any place. And so one of the ways you do is let your, we, we're letting our representative know tonight here, but then also sometimes you'd have to call some of the other representatives and let them know that what their decisions are doing are impacting us. And so we have to make sure, so use the phone also. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Vance. Let's give him a hand. Appreciate it. Both good pieces of legislation, whether it's the House bill or the Senate bill, they have the same language, but um, um, something that I'll be supporting going forward, and, and it always helps to hear from constituents um, about things that they like to see happen in the General Assembly. So uh, I think we'll be moving on. Are we ready? If we're ready to start with um, Valerie Leonard, and we're going to talk about the survey that was just mentioned and how some of these budget impacts will, um, budget proposals will impact our community. So, Valerie Leonard, everybody, let's give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, how is everybody? Very good. Very good. My name is Valerie Leonard, and I have with me Attorney Jeanette Foreman. Um, we wanted to share with you, uh, first of all, the importance of doing this survey. And before we do that, we want to thank Representative Art Turner for actually hosting this. You know, this, this came from the constituents to him. You know, we thought that there was a need to have this budget hearing. He said yes. He rearranged a whole bunch of stuff to come here tonight. So we really, really appreciate it. So shall we give him a hand? <laughs> Okay, so this is going to be a panel discussion, 
And we're going to start off, first of all, with the nonprofit survey, and then we'll go into the impacts of um, Executive Order 8. That will be by Donald Dew. And then after that, we're going to have an overview of FY um, 2015. And when I say FY, that's fiscal year 2015. Um, the state does their budgets in fiscal years from July to June. So the fiscal year 2013 will end this June and 20, I'm sorry, June 30th. And then after that, we will have an overview of FY16 by Bobby Otter. And FY16 will take us from July 1 through June of the following year. So we want to, you know, really reiterate how important this is. You know, we hear a lot of surveys, a lot of data, um, you know, in the discussions, and these data are usually compiled on a statewide basis. Very rarely do they drill down to the community level. And if you live in a community like North Lawndale, you know, we've got unemployment rates of 21 percent. We've got high unemployment. And seriously, you know, we need social services. There's a lack of economic development, but when you look at our economics here in North Lawndale, 50 percent of the people actually work for social services. Our largest employer is Mount Sinai Hospital, and we've got Roberta Rakehove of Mount si Sinai Hospital. Um, they're our largest employer. We've got about 68 agencies, including DHS, that actually service zip code 60623 and 60624. You know, they're going to be seriously impacted by the budget. So lest we think that this is only something that impacts other people, or even, you know, other communities, you know, let's not get it twisted. You know, we're right here, you know, 50 percent of our economy is, you know, driven by social services. So when social services go out, our community goes out, and God knows we can't afford any more of that. So we want to <coughs> share with you, um, give you an overview of the survey link that went out. There are two surveys that went out, one for individuals, so um, Arthur, Representative Arthur Turner um, did a survey that has, I guess, a whole laundry list of all the different ways that we as individuals can be impacted. It could be transportation, it could be student tuition, you know, all the things that we never really think about but take for granted. So um, if you haven't had a chance to look at that, we can send you a link if you signed up and you have an email. What we're going to go over today is going to be an overview of the survey that went out for nonprofit organizations. And again, it's really, really important. This is the only way that we can get a sense for what's going on right here in the community, whereas the other data that's being collected, you know, statewide or citywide, we want to make sure we know what's going on here. Alrighty, so Jeanette, would you want to go through it? Well, the actual thing that I'd like to say is that even those of you who have not collected or, or or made use of that survey yet, I would urge you to, even in the coming days and weeks, continue to work with us and continue to, to actually take it very seriously. And as the Reverend said, not only for yourself, but see that others do it too. Because this is going to be, as you heard the representative say, we're at doomsday. And so it's going to be extremely important for us to hear from you and from your uh, and from your agencies that work with you. And I would say that even though you hear a lot of numbers about millions and so forth, that, and you hear it from the point of view of an agency, believe me, you're giving your own personal story of what happens to you. The person that, for example, says that because the, the child support or the child care has been cut, I cannot go to work. And as a result, I am losing my job. That's the kind of impactful statement that you can give that would be ever so excellent for your representative to hear, be able to take a human story to the legislator, to the governor, and it will be excellent for your media to hear it as well. So with that said, because the lion's share of this wonderful survey has been done by this young woman here, I'm going to let her go through this survey with you. She won't take credit for giving us the idea. Okay, so 
Um, I'm not going to go through every question, but I just want to give you a sense for the kind of information that we're looking for from nonprofits. The first section, basically, um, you give us contact information, you know, such as name, address, blah, 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 you know, who your elected officials are. And that's important because we get to sort through these data and literally drill down to where you are and where the issues are. Um, the next section focuses on things like the mission and the budget and the programs and the impact that you're making. And the reason that's important, um, you're going to hear from um, Commissioner Donald Dew in just a minute, um, one of the issues that uh, the state is looking at is whether or not you, your programs, your state funded programs are actually fitting within your mission. So we want to be able to get a sense for what your mission is and, and have, you know, represent Representative Turner to actually see for himself, do the programs actually line up with the missions? Um, and then the next section is going to focus on the impact of the budget cuts to the organization. And finally, um, the last page, you're going to be able to share your stories, how you think that this problem can actually be solved. You know, people in Springfield, they're very smart, but they don't always have all the answers. We believe that, you know, the constituents can have, you know, some impact and some really good ideas as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Commissioner Donald Dew, who is the um, CEO of Habilitative Systems. All righty. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, I want to thank Representative R. Turner for hosting us this evening and bringing this tall hall meeting together. It is imperative that our voices are heard and continue to be heard, uh, not just by our governor, but by the mayoral candidates, every elected official, and everyone who is a stakeholder, uh, and everyone who cares about what's happening within our communities. So once again, Rep Rep <coughs> Representative Turner, thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm Donald Dew, President and CEO of Habilitative Systems. And I'm also a commissioner with the African American Family Commission. Our executive director, Michael Holmes, will give you some feedback or give you some information and overview about the um, charge and mandate of the African uh, American Family Commission when he comes up. Uh, before I get into um, additional remarks, let me uh, just uh, see a show of hands of um, how many folks um, in the audience tonight um, know someone who presently receives social services? Okay. All right, all right, very good. Uh, another show of hand of um, anyone who um, you know may need social services. Do you know anyone that needs social services? Okay. Another show of hands for anyone that um, you know may work for social services. Okay, all right. And um, do any of you all happen to know folks who have been contracted to do construction work or plumbing or electrical work or Carpentry or anything along those lines for social service agencies. All right. Okay. All right. Very good. So as you can see, and this just kind of illustrates what um, Valerie um, said a little bit earlier in terms of the impact um, that social services has um, within our, our respective communities, and why it's so important for our voices to be heard. Uh, in terms of the executive order, 15-08, um, um, as issued by the governor, is one of his first actions um, during his first 100 days of office, and. For anyone who takes a leadership position, uh, your first 100 days of office uh, says a lot about uh, what your uh, intent is going to be, uh, what your mission, what your mandates are, and, and basically sets the agenda for your term in office. And so uh, the governor is clearly trying to deal with a very difficult and challenging uh, financial um, um, condition within the state of Illinois at this time. Uh, clearly, uh, we know that he inherited um, the financial challenges, and um, it's clear that he had a mandate from the voters within the state of Illinois to do something about it. Now, in so doing, he has proposed um, several sweeping changes that can directly impact uh, some of um, the Illinois, um, what I would um, term Illinois' most vulnerable citizens. Even though, as part of his plank and, and part of his platform, he's been indicating that he wants to protect representative the most vulnerable. Uh, many of the proposed cuts, are, in fact, will be doing more damage and more harm uh, to folks who are the most vulnerable, and in fact, uh, creating another level, or if you will, classification of persons who are vulnerable within the state of Illinois, and in particular, in those communities that are underserved and need the services the most. So um, just to go through some specifics in section 2.1, uh, which speaks to um, procurement and personnel, 
It requires the Governor's Office of Management and Budget to review every state contract or hire made or terminated on or after November 1, 2014. Um, I think you all know what that's all about, right? That's, you know, anything that Governor Quinn did on the way out, I'm stopping, I'm making this, <laughs> it's not going to go. I'm going to review everything that went on. Now, of course, if, if I'm a new leader coming in, I can certainly understand the logic behind that, okay? But if you are a, an employer, if you're a social service agency director, if you've gotten a program off the ground, if you're trying to get people, um, you know, to learn the trades and become a carpenter, electrician, uh, someone who can um, be gainfully employed and take care of the families, and you've started a training program and you think that you're on the road to work, and all of a sudden you're told the program has been defunded immediately with no notice whatsoever, that can be a very challenging thing. I'm very, very happy and pleased that many of our colleagues um, traveled to Springfield um, during the governor's um, budgetary address. Um, they had their hard hats on and their um, vests protesting um, the governor's cuts to those programs, and I'm told that some of those funds have been, in fact, restored. Because that protest happened on the same day as the governor's budgetary address, they made a statement, they made their voices loud and clear and heard, and that program funding was at least partially restored. So I'm very pleased to hear that. So, you know, in comments that I've made previously, it's been very clear that anyone in leadership um, who may not necessarily want to do the right thing must be compelled to do the right thing. So one of the things that we must make sure that our governor understands is the devastating impact that many of these cuts can have, and he must be compelled to do the right thing when it comes to the people that we care about. And I wanted to say care about because I wanted to take it beyond just a, um, a political or social service or policy level discussion. This is about caring about the people that you live with, caring about the people that you love around, caring about the people that you serve, and it's really not about a paycheck. Any of us who work in social services, Dr. Safir, know it's not about a paycheck. <laughs> so it's really about caring about the people that need the service and caring about making sure that these vital services continue. Now, I get loud from time to time it's because I'm trying to deal with the mic going in and out here. So forgive me if I'm shouting and it comes, aloud, comes out too loud. Uh, section 2.4 requires a review of all contracts that are not essential for the state agency's operations. Every state agency was required to provide a report to the Governor's Office of Management and Budget regarding all non-essential contracts with information about how the contracts could be terminated without material penalty to the state of Illinois. Now, what's interesting about that is the term essential. Who determines what is essential? Who determines what is not essential? Well, in an attempt uh, to be in compliance with the governor's mandate and the executive order, Representative, many of the governmental administrators have begun to take an inordinate amount of time to review the release of certain funds for existing programs to go through that level of review to determine whether or not they were essential. So programs that are funding persons with mental illness, substance abuse, developmental disabilities, uh, persons who are at risk of institutionalization, uh, criminal justice related programs, child welfare programs, many dollars are being delayed and in some cases have not been released even as I speak, because this review of what is essential and non-essential is going on. Now in the meantime, while that determination is made and people are trying to really operationally define ultimately what that means, and again, I understand, folk want to be in compliance with the mandate. They want to keep their jobs, I understand that. That's, that's important. But in the meantime, there is a degree of suffering that is starting to occur in the lives of people being served, in the lives of those people who are trying to serve those in need and in greatest need. Now, what is, in fact, the impact of Executive Order 1508? The Governor's Office of Management and Budget has terminated contracts of agencies who receive state funding if the programs for which they have received funding do not seem to fit within the grantee's core missions, as opposed to whether or not the service provided suits the goals and objectives of the state agency that provided the grant. Now, once again, you know, you got to pick out that key word, mission. If they do not fit within the grantee's core mission. So, in this particular case, 
if it is determined that the core mission of the Illinois Department of Human Services is not being fulfilled by a particular contract or program, then they are immediately to recommend that program for termination. Now let me just state what the Illinois Department of Human Services mission statement is. That mission statement that you can see online is to assist our customers to achieve maximum self-sufficiency, independence, and health through the provision of seamless, integrated services for individuals, families, and communities. And again, just to restate, to achieve self-sufficiency, independence, and health through the provision of seamless, integrated services. One thing that they probably should have said in that statement was uninterrupted services. <laughs> Let me try and catch up here. I should have been going through the slide presentation. <laughs> I'm not a techie, you all. I'm a social worker. Uh, let me go back a little bit here. OK, so now, in terms of uh, some of the additional impacts that we see, organization called Ceasefire. You all have heard of Ceasefire, right? Ceasefire was budgeted to receive $4.7 million for 2015. They were notified on March 4, 2015, that their FY 2015 funding was suspended. Funding for FY 2016 was cut 60% to 1.9 million. Some of the ceasefire funds shifted to adult redeploy, whose budget will increase 53% from 7 million in FY 2015 to 10.75 million in FY 2016. Now, adult redeploy is run by the Criminal Justice Authority. Oh, you heard that, didn't you? Okay, um, and by the way, would you hand me my notes right there, Valerie? Yeah. Anyone know what adult redeploy is? Anybody heard of it? Okay. That, that's one reason why I thought I might, you know, get a little bit more information going here. So it, it occurred to me that somebody might want to know why, you know, funding was going from ceasefire to adult redeploy. Now, in a nutshell, a lot of research strongly suggests that if you can provide persons who are detained or incarcerated for nonviolent offenses, of offenses with treatment services, such as substance abuse and mental health services, that the chances of them recommitting a crime are significantly reduced. Now, if I might quote, not sure what I did here, Valerie. Okay. Um, Adult Redeploy Illinois was established by the Crime Reduction Act to provide financial incentives to local jurisdictions for programs that allow diversion of nonviolent offenders from state prisons by providing community based services. Grants are provided to counties, groups of counties, and judicial circuits to increase programming in their areas in exchange for reducing the number of people they send to the Illinois Department of Corrections. So, the Crime Reduction Act is based on the premise that crime can be reduced and the cost of the criminal justice system can be controlled by understanding and addressing the reasons why people commit crimes. It is also based on the premise that local jurisdictions know best what resources are necessary to reduce crime. Rigorous evaluation supports this contention. Now, on the surface, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But could one also conclude that now maybe this program may be pitted against ceasefire for funding? Representative, do we want to be placed in a position where, you know, I'm saying to the folks at ceasefire, oh, well, yeah, I think uh, community-based programs, Dr. Safir, ought to, you know, provide mental health services for those who are currently incarcerated because it makes sense to our profession. So should we be at odds now with ceasefire, you know, for who should get the funding? No. No, we shouldn't be at odds. We shouldn't be fighting about that. What we ought to be fighting for is that both program areas are needed. Oh, Y'all didn't hear me, did you? Reverend, can I borrow your language a little bit? Y'all didn't hear me today, did you? <laughs> I said both areas are needed, not just one, not just ceasefire, not adult redeploy. We need both of them. Both of them. What is ceasefire trying to do? Cease the fire. <laughs> Cease the fire. What's the number one health uh, epidemic in the country? Violence. violence. It's violence. You know, anytime our statistics are higher, 
than those in Iraq and Iran. We got an issue, and we may need to call a ceasefire. That's a little plug for the ceasefire program. Okay, now, in terms of the next component, continuing on with the child care assistance programs, and this was referenced a little bit earlier. Eliminating payments for children cared for by a relative would limit parent choice for more than 15,000 families and eliminate care for many families that work non-traditional hours. Increase parent co-pays by 10.5 million. Limited child care assistance program intake to children five years and younger. Would eliminate school age after school care programs and summer programs for more than 100,000 low income children. Teen Reach, which supports after school programs for 14,000 disadvantaged youth across the state would be eliminated from the budget. After school matters would lose all state fundings. Anybody know what after school matters is? You know, we're talking about eliminating this? Just getting rid of it. Now, you know, before it was called after school matters, I thought that after school matters. <laughs> really simply, I just, you know, on a very logical, common sense level, I thought that activities that you were engaged in after school mattered. I mean, I had three jobs after school. I worked at Continental Bank when they were operating. I worked at Burger King, right there on Cicero and Chicago Avenue. And I worked as a janitor on the weekends. So after school matters. If I'm working that hard, Brother Marvin, it's hard for me to get in trouble, right? OK, so after school really does matter. And then, of course, we look at funding for homeless youth shelters and services. Now, if you see the term, if you see the title, homeless youth shelters and services, could one conclude that the mere use of the term homeless youth might be categorized as essential? <laughs> I mean, is there a question about the need for homeless youth services being essential? Does one really have to question that? These kids are on the street. They have been potentially abused or neglected. One of the initial charges of the African American Family Commission was to deal with the disproportionate representation of African American children in the child welfare system. And so many of the children who don't want to continue in foster care or are bombed out of foster care or other group homes, and certain, they end up on the street. So we're saying that we're not going to care about these children. What about the DCFS budget? We're not going to stop there. It has been proposed that all services to 18 to 21 year olds be eliminated. That was a wake up call, wasn't it? To the tune of 147 million, impacting 2,400 wards of the state of Illinois. Now, you know what that means, right? They already said that they're going to get rid of homeless youth services, right? So you're about to put another 2,400 wards out on the street or in juvenile justice programs. Has anyone took a tour of the Nancy B. Jefferson Juvenile Detention Center? You all know who's up in there, right? They're, they're black and brown kids and poor white kids. That's who's up in there, OK? And do you know, unfortunately, a lot of these kids would love to be in a safe, secure environment. But right now, that's the only choice. So you eliminate this funding to 18 to 21 year olds, there's a strong potential that these kids may end up homeless in that juvenile detention center, or worse, a form of some type of sexual trafficking. OK, the outcome is not good. You know, it has been said to me by local community grassroots representatives that this governor really does not want blood on his hands. Come on, seriously. I, I really think Governor Ronald wants to do the right thing. I think it's up to us to make sure that he understands what the implications of these proposed budgetary um, solutions, as recommended to him, what they could mean to us. It will mean that the governor will have blood on their hands. It does mean that more people will be incarcerated. It does mean that more people will be institutionalized. It does mean that more people will be in the emergency rooms. And it does mean that there would be more expense to the state, not less. I can clap if I want to on that one. <laughs> I tried to drive that point home hard, y'all. I thought, all right, okay. <laughs> so, in concluding, uh, I think it's just important for us to also understand, as Valerie had in illustrated a little bit earlier, that you know we're also talking about economic impact here. You know, we can go for the heart and talk about the need that our people have, you know, for these vital social services, and we can talk about the fact that yes, these services are absolutely essential. But we can also take it to dollars and cents. We can talk about that 50% of the people employed here in North Lawndale work 
and social service agencies. We can talk about the fact, in the case of an agency like Habilitative Systems, Inc., that for the last couple of decades, we spent about $20 million on affordable housing programs and projects right on the west side of Chicago, building two senior facilities, five facilities for people with disabilities, keeping people out of institutions, okay? Saving the state money, doing it cost effectively, having impact, creating a greater quality of life. So social services is not just about social services, it's also about economic impact, it's about small business development, it's about doing what's necessary. I haven't seen too many people depressed, representative, who had economic viability, who had a dollar in their pocket, okay? I mean, if a person was depressed, I'm telling you, I've worked with, you know, Doc, if we work with a person, if we give a, if a person who's actively psychotic comes up with issues, hallucinating, verbally, visually, just talking crazy, as they say, they say, wait a minute, will $5 help you? Oh, yeah, that'll help me out a whole lot. I mean, it's something about economic incentive. It's something about economic incentive. We have found that working with people with disabilities, working with people with various mental levels of challenges, that they do better, you know, when they're given a better quality of life. In fact, it's called normalization. We found that out years ago. When you start getting people out of institutions into the community and integrate them into the community, you increase their quality of life, you give them a better opportunity to succeed. You give them an opportunity to have what they call an impact on recidivism, going back. They don't have to keep going back and forth to institutions if they get the proper support and care. So once again, thank you all so very much for this opportunity. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Well, I want to thank my commissioner, uh, Commissioner Du, for that presentation. What I would like to do is sort of just add to that. Uh, my name is Michael Holmes. I'm the executive director of the Illinois African American Family Commission. And uh, I want to thank the representative for uh, providing this information to his district and to communities. What we, want, what we want to do is to make sure that we're educating communities all over the state. What this budget has done has it's, it's enabled us to bring people together to have a conversation about the things that they know are true and dear to them in terms of providing services for them on a day-to-day -day basis. What, what, what the, the commissioner was sort of getting to, the, I've, I've been on the state side for 20 years. When you, when you run an exercise and start talking about essential and non-essential, what you basically are saying, you're making a, a determination of what you think need to be funded and not funded. And that could simply be someone making a decision that I'm going to fund this program over that program. Teen Reach is an essential program for after school programs across this state. We have kids that if you cut Teen Reach will literally have nowhere to go. We have communities and we have places in this state where there are no services other than that team we service. That is critical. And to make a decision to even categorize that as essential or non-essential is not thinking about providing services to the constituents in which the state government and, and, and individuals who lead the state government should be thinking about. So with that, uh, I'm basically want to do an overview. The Illinois African American Family Commission essentially is, and what we're be quickly becoming, is a, is a research hub, is a policy hub for our legislative black caucus. We work closely with Representative Turner and the caucus members to ensure that they got the information, that they have the research and the data to back up issues and positions they take on various pieces of legislation, because that's critical. You know, as we talk about this survey, this survey is, is, is an exercise that needs to happen because here's what we've been saying at the commission for the last six months. If we would have stood up and started reacting to that $54 million that they took out of our community, everybody remember Neighborhood Recovery Initiative? That was literally $54 million that was being provided to our communities. That was over 4,000 jobs where people were literally working every day, parents and young people. When that was removed from our communities, 
that somewhat started this devastating process that's now sort of being followed up on with this non-essential and essential exercise to get rid of services that exist in our communities. You got to understand that this money is having a tremendous impact on our ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. What the commission does is we monitor legislation uh, in Springfield on a daily basis. There's about 6,000 pieces of legislation got introduced this session. We have a process at the commission where we're actually monitoring bills two to three times a week. We have probably went through two or 300 bills so far. We don't necessarily have the capacity. I don't think we'll get to all 6,000. But what we're doing is looking at legislation, looking at bills, and we're going to our caucus members, and we're asking them to look at these, these things that people are proposing that have a direct impact on our community. And we're looking at it from a perspective that we can analyze the impact of anything that's being proposed on our community. That's the intent. And we've been working with the legislators to help them to understand that these are good things. And, 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 and Representative Turner and the caucus members are down there working on our behalf to the extent that you don't even know the level of work that they're putting down. I mean, they're putting in work on the real. They, let me just say this. Governor, the governor fired three or 400 people when he came in. And, it, and actually, it was his, you know, it was his administration. These were all jobs that were associated with the governor's office or required an appointment in the governor's office. Where the caucus saved 19 jobs. I just want people to know that. <laughs> they saved 19 jobs. And we're talking about individuals that were targeted. We, we couldn't save all the folk that left, but folk that had not left, we was able to get those people into the governor's office. The caucus had a conversation with the governor, and he promised to save those jobs. So that's work that they're doing on behalf of people that don't even know they're doing that. So that's, that's, that's critical. And what we want to do is continue to support the caucus members. And what we, the way, another way we do this work is we work with state agencies. So what we've been trying to do as this executive order got initiated, as this, these budget proposals started getting enacted or being proposed to the General Assembly, we've been talking to state agencies and asking them, how are you all determining what's non-essential and essential? Who are, you, who are you talking with and how are you making that decision? Because that decision is having a direct impact on communities and community organizations. If we, can, if we can get that survey and get that data back, here's what we can do that will change the conversation in Springfield. We can go and say that this is the impact that this decision is having on organizations, on people, on individuals who lives depend on these services. So we're in the process of collecting data all over the state so that every time we have a, an argument with individuals who are proposing to do things different that we feel will impact our communities, we have a backup. We have data that's going to back us up, research that's going to back us up, because that's what's needed. We're in the process of changing the way people are looking at the bills that they propose. We're working with legislators to the point that if they propose something and we have an issue with it, we actually work with them to try to change that because we tell them the impact that it's having on our community. And that's making a difference. The other way um, we, 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 we sort of use this commission, and I say to people, you know, we're kind of reintroducing it. As Commissioner said, it initiated uh, back in 94 a, as a way to work with DCFS and, and this, this, this crowded field of 50,000 kids and, and child welfare. Well, we're sort of spinning it now to say economic development is an issue in our community. It's the main issue in our community. We need to see resources coming into our community to the extent that people can actually create ways to live. People can actually have jobs to take care of their families. That's what we're looking at. And, and the way we do that is we're saying we're involving our community in that. We're meeting with people in the community. We have a standard meeting in my office every Tuesday. We're inviting the community in. Tell us what you think needs to happen with the state that impacts you so that we can then craft an agenda. 
The, the meeting starts at 10, it's from 10 to 12. And February 18, when the budget was given his when the, when the governor was given his budget address, we had 400 people in the church in Springfield talking about an agenda for African Americans across this state. <laughs> and that and that agenda is what we're rolling out at the commission. We're actually working on those issues, and to the point that we're not going to move away from an issue that we've identified as something that needs to change in this state that impacts African Americans. And we have 300 agencies that have signed on working with us. And these are things that we're doing because we know that if, in fact, we do what we're supposed to do, our communities will change. We put a $4 billion ask on the table, right? We're saying that if 15%, which is the is the percentage of African Americans in this state. If 15% of the state resources went to African American communities, that would have been $4 billion from last year's budget. Okay? $4 billion would change our communities overnight. We're trying to get people to just visualize that. We, we wouldn't be running around trying to figure out how we're going to get monies to pay for services that we all know need to be in our communities. And this is an ask in the sense that we understand a redirection of state resources through state agencies can produce those type of resources for our communities. And we're attacking that in a real structural, strategic manner because we want people to understand those are our dollars. And we're going after those dollars. One of the things that we wanted to talk about was the um, the impact of this budget. And where the governor's office, we went and met with the governor's office, uh, budget and management, and what they essentially told us, they are trying to, they are really trying to work with the, the individuals who are most vulnerable, right? Public safety is a priority for them. Um, federal program they said they're not going to look at. But essentially, the only, the only area that I see that they propose that will, will not get really touched with this non-essential and essential is public safety. And then they talk about that's only 4% of what they're proposing. There's a $69, $65 billion budget that was proposed, OK? The reason why Redeploy got $13 million is because he also wants to increase correction dollars. Redeploy is a program that counties would receive funds if they had alternative programming for individuals that was locked up. They attempt to address it with um, adults with mental health issues. They've been running a youth redeploy program in this state for seven years. Could county refuse the money? Okay, because if you don't stop putting people in corrections, there's a penalty. You have to pay for not being able to do the work and keep people out of jail. So adult redeploy is just another way to try to address some issues on the adult level, but it really doesn't mean that they're going to really get at anything. It's another way to pay for services and to be able to keep people involved in a correction environment. So, so the, I mean, the whole issue is really that this budget is, 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 is critical. FY15 is what we're talking about. We haven't got through FY15. If, in fact, and, and, and Bob will talk about this a little bit more, if, if we would have kept that tax revenue in place, which I could never figure out if I even felt it, right? If we would have kept that in place, we wouldn't have had this conversation about these cuts. So the whole idea about I'm saving money by not keeping that tax revenue in place, here's the impact of that. This is the impact of that. So with that, I just really wanted to talk about where we are as a commission. We are working as in partnership with the caucus. We're working in partnership with agencies. We're doing work on the ground across this state to the extent that we want to involve people 
in the decisions that's being made as it relates to African Americans in the state. And we hope that, you know, through a, a meeting like this, um, through helping inform our legislators, that we can get some work done that's going to be in the interest of our communities moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Appreciate it. Next, we have uh, Bobby Otto from the CTBA, and he's going to give a budget overview as well. Again, the theme being um, budget, all things budget, and we'll take, take questions and get a direct impact um, and try to find out some feedback from constituents um, after this. So, Bobby Otto, thank you. Thank you very much, Representative. Do you need this? Yes. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bobby Otter from the uh, Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. Um, I'm going to be talking about the FY16 budget mainly, um, how we got into this mess that we're in right now. And I know uh, Representative Turner has already addressed uh, a lot of these issues. And uh, But I'm going to be giving a big overview of everything. Uh, Mr. Holmes and Mr. Uh, Dew get, gave a really good job at looking at some specific things in the uh, human services area. Um, I'll be taking a little bit, uh, you know, higher level look at things. Um, I like to call it the 30,000 feet or 35,000 feet uh, view of the Illinois budget. So I guess the big thing to stress here is that the reason why we're in this situation right now is that the state has a structural deficit. Uh, that basically means that we don't bring in enough revenue uh, to keep pa pa pace with inflation and the cost of maintaining services that government provides. Um, and this has been going on for decades. And so what they used to do in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even in the 2000s is they essentially borrowed from the pension system. They weren't making the pension payments they needed to make, and that allowed them to continue funding services that uh, everybody, everybody in the state needs. Well, starting about 20, about five years ago, the pension bill started to come due, and the effect has been uh, cutting a lot of the services that we provide. As you know, there's a lot up in the air still uh, for FY15, and then uh, the governor's proposed budget for FY16 uh, is uh, full of a ton of holes, as we'll get into. So I think the first thing that I kind of want to stress here is that nine out of every $10 spent by the state of Illinois goes to four core services. So education, human services, public safety, and health care. That's nine out of every $10. And um, so when people start saying, oh, we have a spending problem in the state, we need to spend less, no, it's not really like that. It's just more of a revenue problem, as you'll see here. So in nominal dollars, so just, you know, $5 to $5, not adjusting for inflation or anything like that, we've actually increased spending in the state about 19% since 2000. However, once we take into effect inflation, you know, what causes toothpaste to increase, uh, or hair, haircuts to increase in price over time. Once we start taking into inflation, especially ECI, so the cost of actual workers, we've cut uh, spending in the state by 28% since 2000. So here's a quick look at the revenue, uh, especially in the general fund that we've been spending. And so we've, as you can see, we've, we're seeing this decrease over the last five, uh, six or seven fiscal years. And what's causing this decrease is that pension payment that I was talking about. The, we have to increase what we're paying into the pensions, specifically the debt that was on those pensions, and that's caused this uh, decline in revenue on general fund spending over time. So you might have heard uh, Mr. Holmes address this a little bit about the tax increase. Well, that expired on January 1st. Um, income tax rates for, pers uh, for uh, the personal income tax rate fell from 5% to 3%. Meanwhile, the corporate rate fell from 7% to 4.8%. Uh, this has created a huge revenue hole in FY15, but especially in FY16, because it's the first time that the whole fiscal year uh, we won't have all that revenue from that uh, the temporary tax increase, um, as we'll see. And so, and, oh, sorry, take a step back here. So the pension the pension issue one more time. This is my fault here. Um, so the gray, as you can see, this is the increase in the pension payment over time, especially that gray bar. Um, so the bill really started to come and do, and because of that, that's forced our payment on services uh, to decrease over time. 
And a lot of people will say on the pension side, oh, the benefits, there's too much in benefits. That's not the cause. The cause is the debt. Uh, because we borrowed, because we weren't making those payments uh, for decades, um, that increased our unfunded liability. And because of that unfunded liability, we now have to pay that back on top of what we normally pay for pensions for our, the workers in the state. So as you can see, the big increases, big, big red bar, that has been the cause of the pension increase over time. So the, the reason why this is going up is because of this red bar, because of that debt that on the pension payment. Anyway, so back to the tax increase. Sorry about that. So what happened was is with the, uh, the, ex, uh, the expiration of the temporary tax increase, our revenue is going down. And our projected revenue uh, in 2016 is only about $31.7 billion. That's down a good $4 billion, I'm sorry, $5 billion from FY14 just two years ago, which was $36.7 billion. So that's why we're facing these huge cuts that, we're fa um, that, that have been talked about previously. Um, so to quickly talk about FY15 here, um, just to kind of give everybody an idea of what the money is going towards. Um, most of that, as I've been saying, most of the payment in FY15 and in terms of hard costs, those things we have to pay, bonds and pensions, most of that is to pensions or the debt service on the pensions. Um, that's 56% of all of our hard costs. Meanwhile, uh, debt service bonds, effectively, is about 25%, 26%. And then there's uh, four that uh, nine out of every $10 being spent on uh, those four Q core services um, that I talked about earlier. And so here's a further breakdown of FY15, the actual numbers here. Um, this was already passed. We're in the, this is our current fiscal year, so $7.4 billion for health care, $6.6 .6 for education, or K-12 through education, about $2 billion for higher education, um, public safety, $1.6, and then human services, uh, $4.8 billion. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, or next couple slides, but this is kind of a walk down of the... the, the, the um, the deficit that the state that the state faces. So in that first line right there, we have the projected revenue for FY15 of 34.5 billion, 34.1 billion. Sorry, um, we have a projected hard cost and payments of 10.6 billion, uh, carry forward deficit. Then you throw in all the general fund uh, spending, um, and what you end up is was with a $7.4 billion deficit heading into FY16. So as we end FY15 in the next couple months and go into FY16, we're already looking at a $7.5 billion, $7 roughly billion dollar deficit, which is roughly 27% of all of our spending as a percentage of our general funds uh, spending currently. And then to kind of further illustrate those cuts that I was talking about um, since FY2000, uh, so in the last 15 fiscal years, we've actually cut, once you start adjusting for inflation, so this third line or with numbers, the FY2000 adjusted for inflation to population, that's what in today's, today's dollars what we spent on, if you looked at human services, we spent $7.3 billion in human services in 2000 once you adjust for inflation. In FY15, we were only spending $4.8 billion. So that's a $2.5 billion difference. 30, we've cut spending on human services by 34% in the last 15 fiscal years. Higher education, you can see a 40% decline. K through 12 education, who doesn't love K through 12 education? Even that we've cut by 13% once you adjust for inflation. And then uh, health care has been cut also by 22%. So all told, there's that 27% cut in... Uh, in spending uh, over the last 15 fiscal years once you adjust for inflation. So FY16, the governor's proposed uh, budget. Remember that $7.4 uh, 7 billion deficit that the governor is going to start out with? So that's right there. That's that first line. Then the loss from the income cut ki kicks in, roughly $5 billion. So now we're at a $12.1 deficit before we've even uh, started figuring out what we're going to spend in FY16 uh, for our services and whatnot. The governor's done a couple things, increased revenue estimates, uh, eliminated some um, 
some other funds, moved them into the general funds. That lowered the deficit a little bit, about 11.1 after that. Um, the governor has also said in its proposal that he's not going to, uh, he's going to change uh, how pensions are funded, specifically uh, in current employees who are currently in what's called Tier 1. He's going to try to move them into the Tier 2, though that will be very difficult for a number of reasons. Um, mainly, uh, the General Assembly might not go along with that plan, one. Two, it's probably unconstitutional. <laughs> so. Talking of, he's gonna. That's an uphill battle that he he's fighting there. But he thinks he can save 2.2 billion dollars if he's able to do that. He's gonna cut some statutory tan, uh, transfers, um, and then one point. He's proposed 1.2 billion dollars in general fund cuts uh, from FY15 to FY16. Even after, and and in some of those cuts are to Medicaid. Sorry, and Medicaid is a. Um, a federal match program. So for every dollar you cut in Medicaid, you also lose a dollar from the Fed. So it's really a two-dollar cut. So really, after so after all the governor's proposal, we're looking at a proposed deficit in FY16 that we're projecting at CTBA to be 8.9 billion dollars. So even though the governor is cutting roughly six billion dollars through some legal and some illegal proposals. <laughs> he's still going to have a deficit that is $1.5 billion greater than the current deficit is heading into the fiscal year. So we really have this revenue problem. Despite what the governor wants to tell us, we really have a revenue problem in the state right now. Um, and this is some more detail on some of those uh, changes that he's proposing. Um, here's uh, the pension contributions that I was talking about and, the, and some changes uh, to statutory transfers that's going to he thinks save him about $3 billion. So let's look at the actual general fund appropriation proposals that the governor's put on the table. Um, higher education is taking a huge cut here, about 20%, $400 million. It's going to make higher education even more expensive for everyone. Uh, human services, actually not a huge cut that they're looking at, only $63, bill, $63 million, sorry, a 1.3 percent cut. <laughs> However, as we are well aware here, uh, human services has been cut so much as it is over the last 15 years that there's really not a ton to cut anymore. That's the other thing to address here. And healthcare is taking a significant cut, a 14 percent cut. Um, and a lot of the services that we're, we've been talking about today are also funded through um, health care or can be classified as health care spending. So the human services, it doesn't look like a lot. It's just how we kind of uh, calculate things at CTBA. But um, when you look at health care and human services together, um, that's almost a $1.1 billion cut uh, in, in total. And all told, $1.8 billion in cuts that the governor's proposed, which would be a 7% uh, decrease from last year. So let's, uh, I'm going to finish with the uh, structural deficit, which I talked about uh, at the beginning. Um, so the blue line, the top line that you see there, those are uh, the appropriations that we've calculated moving forward. Um, just continuing spending at the current level, factoring inflation and some population adjustments, kind of what the state will continue spending going forward. Um, the green line, well, I'll skip the green line because of the pension law. The, uh, the yellow line is what revenue would have been, what revenue would have been if we had kept the tax increase, the temporary tax increase, instead of letting it expire. So even with, if we had kept the temporary tax increase, we still would have that gap. You see the, this gap here. This is the structural deficit that, we, that I was, I've been talking about. The red line, that is with the tax cuts expiring, which actually happened. As you can see, that's just going to get bigger and bigger over time. So we need to address the, the revenue issue in the state before we start really thinking about more service cuts to anything else in the state, because that's not really where the problem is. And it's not really where the savings is either. So um, that wraps up what I have to say. I think we're going to Q&A, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's give Bobby a hand. Thank you. <laughs> Bobby Otto. They're from the Center of Tax and Budget Accountability, which is a nonpartisan organization that gives you a, a very um, clear update. As you can see, the numbers are scary when we start talking about um, FY16, the proposed cuts. Um, and, and everything associated with that. Um, 
the tax increase expiring was a huge hit for our bottom line in the budget. And, and it really concerns me when you hear the governor out and when we're talking, and he, he says that there's no interest from his administration or any Republican in the General Assembly for addressing or even entertaining any idea of new revenue. So with the problems that we have, I mean, as you've seen in, in the human services budgets and others, there's just nowhere else left to cut. We are down to the bone in certain situations. And, and so I don't know how we're actually going to get there without entertaining or even talking about new revenue. Um, we're hoping that something, that's something that he'll give more thought to and maybe revisit as we continue to talk about crafting the budget for FY16 and move through this legislative year. At this point, I know you've gotten a lot of information about the budget and um, the proposed cuts and, and things that are taking place with FY15. We'd just like to hear from you guys on, on how these impacts will affect social service agencies or U.S. constituents in general, as well as um, ideas or, or things that I can take back to Springfield with me or specifics that I can fight for in Springfield as it pertains to this FY16 budget as we start to craft that in the next coming months. So um, we'll open it up for questions, comments, anything at this point. Ms. Frederick in the back. Already. I know people that get babysitter checks shouldn't have it, you know, so what, and, and that's causing the problem because it's like milking the system and you don't deserve it. So is there a medium line that he's willing to consider when it comes to accountability and watchdogging who really deserves it and who not, or is he just want to cut it all in general? No, that's, that's. Okay, so the, the question was, uh, would there be any sort of, I guess in general, accountability measures put in place when we're addressing or trying to determine where the cut should come or what, who will get funded going forward? And that's a great comment and a great question. Um, I don't know if there's a specific plan in place. You heard um, Director Holmes allude to earlier, um, there need to be, or, or Mr. Duke, who may have said something about um, who's determining what's, um, an essential program, who's doing the work. So the com compliance portion from the but from the governor's office is um, they said that that will be a big part of how they're making their determinations going forward. But what that cons compliance procedure looks like is something that we have to work through with them. But this is all something that we take into account in our budgeting for results process um, that we've been doing with the budget crafting for the past couple, as long as I've been in the General Assembly. And that's where they go with a line by line item um, uh, investigation into who should get what line items should be included but I think that as you suggested there should be a more fine-tuned combing of those programs and compliance checks on them to make sure that the funds are being appropriated and that those who are using the funds are using them for the things that they were appropriated for. People that fund like paying their house rent and fund trips with team reach accounts. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it needs to be something in there. Yeah, they, they've talked about doing reform on the Medicaid rolls and everything in terms of um, who gets what and what services are being provided. So not just the grants and funds, but also other services that are being provided by state. Thank you. We'll start from left to right. That's right. Um, you know, the government is doing the right thing when it comes to these unions. So we need a right to work state because if you look at uh, a carpenter, for example, you know, see, our generation, we didn't get nothing from whatever happened, you know, all these years, 40 years. We got nothing. So it works in our favor, what he's doing. Uh, this, 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 one of these construction jobs, for example, for a carpenter. The carpenter makes about $43 an hour base pay. There's an extra $28 an hour attached to the $43 an hour that goes to these unions. We're so anti-union because the, the unions are anti-us. So, uh, and then when it comes to a lot of these programs, um, I think he's cutting it because if you look at for the last 30 years, unemployment has not gone down in our community, but the program is consistently being funded. So we're organizing to make sure that he cuts some of these programs off because we, we I mean, everything has hurt us, you know. And, and, uh, well, you make some good points, Mark. I, I think that, that everything's on the table at this point, and the administration has been, been clear about that in terms of um, vetting and making and deciding who gets what going for it. As far as the right-to-work conversation, 
the attorney general just released a statement or an opinion on um, how that would happen or some of the things that the, the governor has proposed and said that it would be illegal or unconstitutional for them to do right to work zones, that if it were to be a right to work conversation, that it would have to be all or nothing. So right to work for the entire state or no right to work at all. I think it's an important conversation that we definitely have to have going forward. You're right, traditionally, when you talk about unions, a lot of our um, community hasn't been included, but at the same time, you know, you, there's a whole, when, you, when you have that union discussion, you're lumping unions in general. And there's a difference in our numbers and representation in the public sector unions versus our numbers and representation in the trade sector. And I think that we definitely need to have an a, a open and honest conversation about how we can make some changes going forward when you really start to talk about those trade unions. So that's a good point. Thank you. Yes, sir. On that same token, when we look at the scrutinization of uh, public services and welfare, we need to be looking at the uh, public welfare that we give big business. Amen. 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 Big, big, business, big business has been getting a cut for a long time. There's nothing in any proposal that the governor is talking about right now that has anything to do with big business. And big business is, is one of the problems that we have. That welfare from big business right. is really one of the problems that we have. It's not been right. mentioned at once by this government. Yes, sir. You're you're absolutely right, and I could have put, I couldn't have put it better myself. Now, if you remember from the campaign trail, the governor alluded to maybe addressing some of these corporate tax loopholes and some of the incentives that they're getting. But since he's taken office, that conversation has totally ceased, and we haven't seen any making or any discussions from the FY18 budget proposal, the um, FY16 proposal that he put forth on February 18th. No talks of big businesses. So if there's going to be no talks of new revenue, then we definitely need to address big businesses and the corporate welfare that they receive. Yes, sir. That I'd just like to mention. When you start to try and process how we're going to fund for the pension, you do have lawyers that work for these unions and everybody else, when you don't pay into your union, that weakens your chances of negotiation. So a right to work state is about as stupid as you can get. I agree. Okay. Just, again, that's a, that's a big discussion that we'll be having throughout, throughout this whole year. The governor has made that a priority for his administration, but it's not necessarily something that all of us has, have bought into as, as, as the General Assembly. So that will be a discussion we'll have going forward. Yes, ma'am. So the council had addressed um, essential and non-essential. From what I saw about the numbers, you can have the same pot of money, but the Illinois Department of Human Services covers a range of things. So with the type of governor that we have in office currently, the way he may see um, human services is prisons and nursing homes <laughs> as a whole, because the people that he knows and works with and does business with own prisons and nursing homes. So then you have the, the money that went to, say, hire me or hire her to take care of people in our community, work with education, and revolve that money going to prisons and nursing homes instead of at-home care or child care. So we have to make sure that we address not only what is essential or non-essential, but the financial behind that. You have more people working in the community when it's broken down to entrepreneurship and um, individual contractors. But our governor is not a respecter of individuals, entrepreneurs, and small contractors. He is a more of a respecter of his cohorts that own prisons and providing elderly services by putting everybody in nursing homes, where they also have no accountability because the prisons and the nursing homes are, should not even be standing. You have a better chance at an after school matters program for somebody to receive a decent human service than to go into the prison or to the nursing home and get a decent. So that's what we need to pigeonhole is we may have this budget, but we don't want it to go to the prisons and the nursing home again. Good evening everyone. My name is William Kiley. And uh, I just want to say that uh, Illinois has a great, great problem about this uh, financial situation. And uh, part of this problem, or a great deal of this problem as I see it, 
is that we are losing jobs. We are losing jobs to Wisconsin, to Indiana, to Iowa, to Missouri, and all of our neighboring states there. We're bleeding jobs. And this is one thing that we need, is to get those jobs back to Illinois and keep the ones that we have here. Uh, somebody said that we're cutting to the bone. I don't believe that. I just heard that someone gave someone a $10 million grant to buy land. And they said that they never even uh, bought the land. The money's still in the ethernet someplace. So we, the check was cash. The check was cash. Yeah, well, we've got to find out where our money's going. We've got to go over those books and find out where all this money is going. And is there lots of money being set aside that is not being used properly? We need to use that money properly because uh, we need to keep all of our jobs here in Illinois. And we can't do that if we've got laws that with workmen's compensation that are killing this state. People are taking up lock, stock, and barrel and moving 10 miles over to Indiana. We cannot keep up doing the same thing that we have been doing. It's time we had a change. Well, I'm going to tell you, Ms. Kylie, I think that when we start to have these discussions around, um, you know, economic development and revamping the, the workers' compensation formula that we have here in the state, as well as dealing with some of our pension issues, which, you know, affect our bond rating and affect how we incentivize companies to come to the state, all those discussions will be going on, especially since we're not talking about new revenue. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to piggyback off of the two former sister statements about efficiency because I know, I know for a fact the systems that the state uses to operate are so deficient. So you're looking at whether or not the program itself is needed or relevant or efficient, but the systems that govern and run the program are what's deficient, are what's causing the inefficiency. For example, the child, the child care system. Well, you have a family that <coughs> applies, they have to submit information to prove that they are eligible to receive the funding, right? But you don't have enough caseworkers to go through all of that information. And so then what happens is the family automatically gets approved for an additional six months. What if that person isn't even working <coughs> or in school? Mm -hmm. They just got approved for an additional six months yeah. of funding because yeah. of a lack of caseworkers to be able to go through those cases expeditiously enough mm -hmm. to handle the cases. So you have really, really faulty systems that end up in money that is possibly wasted upon wasted upon wasted. Mm -hmm. And then families who really, really are eligible, families who really, really do need the services mm -hmm. are not gonna get the services because the families who gonna take that six months of funding knowing they don't, they're not even eligible for it. And it's not their fault either because the systems that are supposed to govern that and check that and watchdog that, they can't do it because there's not enough people to do it. And then you say we don't have jobs that we need to, to We have plenty of jobs that, that need to be done, and that's one of them right here in the state, mm -hmm. is how are we watchdogging the programs that, that fund you know, these, these, these programs that are in the community, how are we watchdogging them? Mm -hmm. Because there is definitely, definitely money being wasted and being used inappropriately. And it's making families who really, really need it suffer. Because yeah, people know which ones are the lick. They know which ones. Yeah. They're like, girl, you yeah. can go ahead and get this, you'll get that. They know which ones is a lick to hit. Like, really? Yeah, the inefficiencies have been going on for a long time, for a very long time. And yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's highlighted now even with w when you realize that we have very, very limited resources that we're working with right now. And so making sure that the right people get the right resources um, and efficiency being taken into consideration is going to have to lead those discussions. So you're absolutely right in that, in that respect. Ms. Follows. I just wanted to add a few things. 
A lot of money being stolen before it get down to them little change. That money been stolen up there. They don't okay. make it from the other country. Why yeah. we messing with little link cards? That's a whole yeah, other story. Yeah. But back at the ranch, what's going on is we need to deal with where we are right now. I think the commission with uh, Commissioner Holmes and what what they've been doing on Tuesday can kind of address the issue they're talking about because they're meeting with nonprofits trying to strategically be proactive instead of reactive. Not only hold us accountable, but the commission accountable and the community accountable. So that is being put in place. The other thing, the governor's wife is uh, not for profit. She works in the area, so he sleeps with a lady that understands pain of our community because her organization has been funding child care zero to three. So it's not like he don't know what's going on. His wife does that. <laughs> so we need to maybe you ladies need to have a conversation with his wife and start having a conversation about it. That's one thing. The other piece is. Uh, the other safety net, there's organizations that buy, uh, buy your, uh, what you owe that the government don't pay. You pay the federal government for your money and you get your money and then they get on the back end. We may need to look at those agencies that pay off your debt to give you your money and they'll get it from the government when it comes. They do that. So we're going to have to do that because we're in a bad bottleneck and lose it real quick. The other piece. Those agencies that are, need to be evaluated to consolidate into one organization, they need to do that. I'm talking solution for safety net, because I've been in social service. If we don't deal with it like that, the bottom will come out and we're going to starve it there. So those are some things I'd like to suggest. Very good points. Thank you. Yeah. That's on. That's on. On, the top, on the top of my conversation, I would just like to say that I absolutely agree with Reven on his last point. <coughs> about uh, creating linkage agreements and not trying to reinvent the wheel, especially on the south and west side of Chicago. Uh, Lawndale, for instance, we spend more money on social services than they do in small countries and funding wars. And the poverty level is the same, the crime is higher than it has ever been. And it acts like a CIA slush fund. So one of the ways to combat that is to create uh, linkage agreements with organizations that are already there, already doing it, to move forward. However, I want to say that uh, I think that our representative does a great job in Springfield. I'm often down there with busloads of people lobbying on behalf. Well, I, I shouldn't say lobbying because I'm not a lobbyist, but screaming and hollering and fussing on behalf of the people that I pastor here in Lawndale so that they could get their just due. Because we live in the greatest country in the world, and this country has a constitution that says that the government is for the people, by the people, and of the people. As a representative, I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, your job is to move on behalf of 51% of your constituents. If you get 51% of the people that say this is what we need to be doing, technically that's what you're supposed to do because you're there to represent us. You're not there to tell us what to do. So and with that being said, I think that we need a greater push from the local community, all government is local, to start participating when we get this information like the state representative is bringing us mm -hmm. and put having our voices to be heard for real so that he understands our pain so that when he goes to Springfield and gets up and says okay here's where we see it governor in Lawndale there need to be 33,000 registered voters standing behind him in Springfield mm -hmm. that day Absolutely. the governor right. understands that because it was the votes or the non the lack of voting that put this governor in office. And so the reality of it is, the only way we really are going to change this is we have to, for real, participate in the democratic process in this country. And the way we do that is, we have to stand behind our representatives or our aldermen or whoever those people are, and we have to be there on that day saying, this is what we want, and don't you change it. And don't you change it. And I just kind of want to throw that out there, because I keep going to these meetings. And when I go to these meetings and I hear people uh, I call it bellyache and complain, mm -hmm. it's always after the fact that they didn't go to vote. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say this in closing so it'll be on the record. You got to get that going. Reverend Hunter is not against unions. And the reason why I'm not against unions is because unions help create the middle class. A. Philip Randolph was a union man, and he was a black man. And, we, and people fared sumptuously because of that. Now, what happened afterward is a problem, but we also, as I close, have something called the African American Employment Act. That act was created by a black man for black people to create capacity and employment in the state of Illinois. 
What I don't understand is, if the government want to do a right to work state, how come he hasn't looked at the African American Employment Act and really went over it to either strengthen it or comply with it, along with Kevin Hall, with uh, Brother Holmes' uh, organization, and create more capacity for black people in the state of Illinois? I'm just saying. Thank you, Pastor Senator. And I can assure you that, that <laughs> um, Director Holmes will be involved in all of those discussions as we um, continue to move through this legislative session. The, um, the commission is a great resource for, for us as representatives down on this end. And I'm gonna get to you on this end. We're gonna take a couple more questions because we've gotta make a few announcements before we close out and, and respect, respect people's time. So, so Nidra, do you, do you have a question, Ms. Johns? I actually have a comment, and that's just working from, uh, many of you all may know, I'm <coughs> Senator Van Pelt, and then working with the African-American Family Commission on different things and uh, sometimes to me the responsibility is easy to just pass it on but the truth of the matter is the community as a whole have not done our part as, as far as building up power and things that we can do on our end i'm reminded of a document that was written by president obama advisory council and it was it was um the president and his experts and what they saw what community relationship looked like it's a hundred page document and you can read it if you read it, you'll see that Governor Bruce Bonner is just duplicating what President Obama put out in 2012. We have to start working with the community, with the government, as well as with the private sector. And so uh, a lot of things that we're hearing is capacity building. But what I see even with some of the programs that exist in the community, you have, first and foremost, 501c3 should really, they should state a mission, accomplishment, and move on to something new. But we have people who've been around in the community years. for years and not moving with yes. the trend of things. Yes. For example, right now, there's a lot of grant money in the technology sector for after school programs. There's a lot of money in apprenticeship programs and different things, but it's like we're being stubborn and not willing to move with That's the trend right. of things. If they funded something last year and they say this year's technology, it seems like we should regroup. Right now, uh, with what the governor is saying, it's like we're listening for all the negative things, but every time I hear him speak, I hear a lot of positive things as far as ways that we can regroup and recollect and work with his administration. Now, he's put out a document uh, that states what they want to do in every area, whether it's economics, education. And so we need to look at their mission statements and review our mission statements. Right now, uh, and that's basically it. We also need to consider the social enterprises within our non for profits There's not going to always be public money, but there is private industries and there's partnerships that's open and available. There's a lot of corporations that just don't know who to give the money to. And so they're talking, they come and talk to different people. And sometimes people are just too busy to even hear the opportunity. But I just would encourage everyone to not look at the glasses half, uh, half empty, but more as half full. This is a new day and it's so much opportunity. I would just suggest that you all check out those documents and see how we can work together because I see different people at different meetings, different tables. And when opportunity presents itself for us as community people to take some of the resources that are available, we do not show up. Or we show up and we work as individuals. They say that there's an RP out, everyone go in a separate corner and decide who's gonna go in the room, what they're gonna do, we're gonna get the money, and then they get mad when someone else gets the money versus getting together before they go in a room and tell them, you know what, give us the money, we'll divide it up amongst ourselves. So I look forward to working with you all as far as the capacity building with the number of profits and helping to develop social enterprises as well as partnering with corporations to bring some of the private money back. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's uh, Senator, <laughs> from Senator, Senator Pelt's office, we're always happy to have you out and thank you for being here. We're going to close it out with two final questions or comments before we shut things down. And say, I'm going to go to the young Fargo to Dr. Sapir, and then I'll get you to the Yes, ma'am. I want to ask a question about the Lions program. Yes. If they're going to cut it out, is there anything you're going to be willing to put on the table and replace it with to help the low income people with their utility bills? <laughs> A very good question. The Lahi program, again, he's proposed that they close and shut that out, but it's just a proposal. That's not something that we would allow or something that we would work against as representatives going forward. It's one of those gems that we have in the budget that I think that the people who came in and crafted his proposed budget weren't necessarily in tune with how important that program was and how effective it was for so many people. So uh, those are sorts of things that we'll be campaigning against, removing programs like Lahi. But, um, the, the elimination of the program at this point is just a proposal. Oh, okay. <coughs>
That's great. Do you have a question or comment? Uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Rashad Safir, and I'm the president and CEO of the Bobby Wright Comprehensive Behavioral Health Center. Uh, some of you may know we're located at 9 South Kedzie, right across the street from 10 South Kedzie. Been there for 43 years. And um, over the course of that 43 years, you know, we have suffered the cuts that you've seen explained to you tonight. Um, one of the things I want to point out, uh, Representative, as you look at the uh, FY16 proposed cuts, and this may come under the uh, governor's definition of essential non-essential. I think someone has, um, uh, he's gotten some, some, some real poor advice. Uh, there's an item that's called psychiatric leadership. And I think that it's been misunderstood that when people hear about psychiatric leadership, they probably initially think that we're putting psychiatrists in leadership roles within our agency. <laughs> what psychiatric leadership actually does is it provides funding for us to be able to pay the cost of having a psychiatrist evaluate and provide psychotropic medication to consumers who suffer from bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, I could go on and on with the disorders, okay? So we cannot afford to pay the rates that psychiatrists charge, and Medicaid does not pay psychiatrists at the rate that would, where it would compensate for uh, the services that they're providing. So the state implemented this program called Psych Leadership that basically gives us capacity dollars where we can afford to bring in a psychiatrist who spends approximately 20 hours a week seeing patients who need psychotropic medication. In the governor's FY16 budget, that's one of the programs that's slated to be eliminated. If that program is eliminated, just in our agency alone, we're going to see anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people without psychiatric medication. Now, you can imagine what that's going to be like, because these are people who, without their medication, some of them uh, have voices that tell them to do dangerous things to themselves, to do harmful things to other people. Uh, why don't you jump out in front of that bus? Uh, why don't you set this house on fire? Why don't you go over and slap that person upside the head? We're going to see all, you're talking about public safety? We're going to have a serious issue with public safety within our communities if we cannot get people the medications that they need to uh, eliminate and control these symptoms that cause them to do these harmful things to themselves and, and to others. The other point I want to make, and I'll sit down, is that uh, the combination of medication, case management, and counseling works. Yes. Okay? yes. It keeps people functioning <coughs> optimally within their community. And just a, a couple of, uh, of stats. 85% of the people who participate in our psychosocial rehabilitation program stay out of the hospital, OK? 94% of the adults who participate in our adult outpatient program stay out of the hospital. 91% of the consumers in our developmental disability program stay out of the hospital. Now, if you look at shifting those dollars that the governor's cut to paying for inpatient psychiatric services, then that deficit is going to look a lot bigger than it does. A friend of mine shared a hospital bill with me that one of his clients brought in uh, several weeks ago. This person was in the hospital for, I believe, 10 or 12 days. <clears throat> the bill was $35,000. $35,000. We keep people out of the hospital for less than $75 a day. So, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, it, it, it's dumbfounded to think that we would <coughs> cut money from community-based mental health 
and put it into prisons or anywhere else when we're saving the state literally millions of dollars a year. Thank you, Dr. Spear. That's a very good point. Many of our, a lot of our, with 83 million being proposed to be cut from mental health and mental health services in the FY16 budget, that's a very real concern and one that we have, have to address. We've got one more question before we make a couple announcements and then we, we're gonna have to shut it down because we're past our eight o'clock deadline. Ms. Patton. Well, actually, it's just really a comment now that Bobby Wright uh, got up and shared because that was my concern and my question because I see a lot of those patients that he's talking about and I just know that that is something that's really needed. So. Uh, prayerfully, we'll, we'll get that budget back because we really need that for the patients that we see uh, in our community. That's a very good point. Oftentimes, if they don't in, get the services at the hospital, they end up in the jails, and our jails are becoming the holding cells for our mental health people. We've got to shut it down. There's, I've, I've got just a couple of announcements to make. You heard a lot about voting and things like that. We have um, um, both automatic candidates from the 24th Ward here with us today, Ms. Veacher's voice and Mr. Michael Scott Jr. on that end. So thank you for coming out. Um, this being a, a, a district office meeting for the state, we can't do campaign stuff here, but those are the two that are running and, and they're here in attendance and we're glad that you're here and looking forward to working with you. Um, we also have another announcement about, uh, well, first we'd like to thank Roberta Redcove about for, for this from Sinai for allowing us to use the room and always being so helpful and opening up her doors for us. Thank you. We really appreciate it. This is, um, it was a very important meeting for us.